Welcome back to another study in the Gospel of Acts, or the, the book of Acts. We're starting uh, right after uh, where we finished up last time, chapter 16, verse 3 and 4. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for everybody that's joined in. Pour out your spirit on them, dear Lord. I ask that you would remove me from this teaching, that your Holy Spirit would be the one that does it. And I bless you, Father, for doing that. Lord, touch the hearts of anybody that chooses to tune in. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Uh, my name's Clyde Moyer. I'm the associate pastor of Clifford Baptist Church. I welcome you to the study that we have in, pro in progress already. Let's start with verse 16, uh, chapter 16, verse 3, where we finished up. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took him and circumcised him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. We finished up talking about the fact that while Paul had not had Titus uh, be circumcised when he was uh, dealing with the people in the area where he had met Titus, he is going to have Timothy circumcised where they're going now. In both situations, it was beneficial to the presentation of the gospel for Titus not to be circumcised, but it was also beneficial for Timothy to be circumcised in order to, for both of these gentlemen to fit into the communities that they were in. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 20 says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Paul tried to fit in. Circumcision had no bearing on Timothy's salvation. The rite was performed simply because it would, it would enhance his ministry there. Verses 4 and 5 say, And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that, that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Not only is Paul visiting the churches that have been founded the first time, but he is starting new churches and new groups of believers in new places, and people are turning to Christ everywhere they go. Verse 6 says, Now when they had gone through throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now, Galatia includes this entire area. I'm of the opinion that Paul moved into the northern part of the country about now. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the province of Asia is south where Ephesus is. In fact, Ephesus was the chief city of the province of Asia. We're told that the Holy Spirit forbid Paul to preach uh, in Asia, so he thought, well, um, I want to go there, and the Spirit of the, uh, the Spirit of God wants the Word of God given out, but the Spirit said you can't go to Asia. So Paul thought, well, if you can't go south, I'll go north. Well, that seems logical to me as well. Bithynia was in the north, and that was along the Black Sea. Uh, that was also a large population center, and there was a very heavy concentration of Jews in that area. And that's an area of Turkey today. Just want to take a quick side trip here from the scripture. Um, I've been f blessed to go on <coughs> two mission trips to uh, Bulgaria. And for some reason, it never, and this is on the Black Sea as well, for some reason, it never dawned on me how far Paul actually went on his, on his travels. Um, in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, we were putting in a fence, a security fence, and we had to dig the footing by hand, part of it. And I kept hitting these rocks. I mean, it just shake your eye teeth out. And after I dug three or four of these things up, I realized that they were square. Uh, and here's one right here. I brought it home. And I thought, that's not a natural formation. These are granite-type uh, rocks, and granite just doesn't do that. So I started asking around, and come to find out, what this is, is a Roman cobblestone. Uh, the Romans were all up through Europe up in there, and I'd had no doubt, no, no idea of that. Now, later on, uh, we went into a city called Plovdiv, Plovdiv, Bulgaria. That's P-L-O-V-D-I-V. -V. And at Plovdiv, there is a Roman Colosseum there, all in marble with Latin inscribed on it. I mean, the whole stage where things would be shown, the, there was the center area where 
uh, gladiators would fight. And remarkably, in the, on the edge of the town of Plovdiv, there was this little ruin uh, there of this tiny little church. And when I read the sign on this tiny little church, I was dumbfounded and I really felt like I was standing on holy ground, to tell you the truth. Um, this church exists from the time of Paul, and the sign said that while they cannot prove it, they are almost certain that Paul would have preached there at least once. So I got to stand on an area that Paul got to actually preached in, and this is on the area of the Black Sea. So this very general part of the world that we're talking about right now. Uh, Paul kept going west. Uh, well, rather, he had gone south. Uh, God said, stop going south. So he decided to go north to Bithynia. And God said, don't go north. The only place left, he'd come from the east. Well, if you've checked all the east, north, and south, the only thing left is west. So Paul went west until he got to Troas. Now, he had to stop there. Uh, because at that point, you need a ship to go any further. Uh, Paul couldn't imagine what he was supposed to do. Uh, very bluntly, if we had been able to ask Paul at this point, well, where are you going and what's your plans? Paul would have said, I ain't got any idea at all. I've tried three directions, and God said no to all three. He hadn't told me what yet. He just said no as to the other directions. So far, in this direction, he hasn't said no. Uh, verse 8 says, And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. <coughs> uh, and then 9 says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. This is what's called the Macedonian call. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, verse 10 says, And after he had seen the vision... Immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. I apologize for the crows. Apparently they think they can teach this lesson better than I can. I have no idea why they decided to come. But anyway, the, the word says they endeavored to go. Now, interestingly enough, this, there's a we in here, and there's we because now it's... Uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. Luke joins the team right here. Therefore, loosing at Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. Uh, Neapolis is just a bit inland from the coast. From Neapolis, they went to Philippi, and Philippi is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and it was a colony. Now, because it was a colony, that means Roman colony. And it says we were in that city abiding certain days. Uh, these people would have been Roman, uh, familiar with Roman customs and most likely, if not certainly, would have spoken Latin. <coughs> Latin was not a dead language at that time. It was still an active language. This was their first destination in Europe. Paul went to a strategic place, uh, this town, to, to do his ministry. And if nothing else, that makes Philippi a remarkable church. This church was very close to the heart of Paul. Paul loved the church, and this church loved him. And if you've ever read the book of uh, the Philippians, uh, you will see that there is a great joy every time Paul speaks to these people. Verse 13 says, And on the Sabbath we went out from the, of the city by a riverside, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. Uh, I don't know how this got started, but apparently down by the river there was a prayer meeting that happened fairly uh, regularly. It seems likely that the woman we're going to talk about may have been the one that founded it. Verse 14 says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and that she attended unto the things which were spoken of by Paul. Lydia had already been worshiping the living God. She was worshiping Jehovah already. She didn't know anything about salvation, but she was already worshiping. Apparently, she was a very prominent person and a leader in the area. Um, it seems that she would have been the leader of the prayer group, as we said, and lo and behold, she turns out to be the very first convert in Europe. 
verse 15 says, And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Her entire household came to salvation through her witness. And not only that, now we find Paul and Luke and Silas and Timothy all staying there at her house. Several things seem to be implied by this. One is she must have had a pretty good-sized house. Secondly, if she had a fairly good-sized house, she must have been wealthy. Uh, it has been said that Lydia was a seller of purple. Uh, purple was a color that was hard to come by. It took a lot of work to produce it. And in general, I believe I'm correct in saying that only royalty or very high officials were allowed to wear the color purple. Verse 16 says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now what we're talking about here is this girl was possessed by a demon. We're seeing a resurgence of demonism in our own day, sadly. Uh, in the past few weeks, I have uh, ministered to two different people uh, that are being attacked or harassed by demons. It is not something that went away. Uh, these are fallen angels of Satan's. Um, and we're told that as we go towards the end of time that uh, demonic activity will increase, and it certainly is. Mm -hmm. Now, verses 17 to 19 say, The same followed Paul and us, meaning the slave girl that was div a div diviner. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace under the rulers. Why would a demon <clears throat> basically tell the truth about who Paul was? Very simple. The demon was scared to death. Uh, demons know who, who God's people are. Demons also know the power that God allows in and through his people. Uh, the demon was just telling the truth, uh, and he was afraid. If you go back in the New Testament, in some places you'll uh, see where the demon asked the, the Lord, uh, have you come to throw us into the abyss before a time? Uh, they are very well aware of who Christ is. By the way, let me take this opportunity just to throw in a little bit about salvation. So many people will tell you that they know they're saved because they believe that Jesus is who he said he is. <clears throat> Problem is, is the Greek word used for believe in the way it takes to get saved means to commit to, rely upon, trust in, adhere to, to put all your faith in a person or an object. So it's an action word. People that, meant, that simply and only mentally agree with the facts about Jesus are not saved. They are absolutely not saved. How can I know that? Satan knows who Jesus is more than we do. Satan can quote more scripture about him than we can, but he is not saved. You have to repent, and it has to be brought into your heart by invitation to Christ. Uh, so this girl is following Paul and Silas and these folks through town, and everywhere they go, she's screaming behind them, these guys are serving God, the true God. Now that would have to get a little irritating after a while. And at some point, Paul's had enough, and he just turns around and casts the demon out of her in the power of God. Well, the slave girl is freed, and you would think that that would make the, her owners just tickle to death. Absolutely not. They were absolutely incensed that Paul would do this. This is how they made their money. She told fortunes. She told the future for people. You say, well, how in the world could she do that? Well, Satan has power, and his angels have power, just like the angels of God have power. So when the demon was cast out of this girl, she couldn't do any of this anymore because she was free. <clears throat> she was set free, but Paul ended up being in prison because of it. The owners of this girl got mad. They said that they thought that their livelihood had now been destroyed. So verses 20 to 21 say that they brought them to the magistrates, saying, 
These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. <clears throat> Remember that Philippi is a Roman colony. Romans worshipped many, many gods. In fact, they wouldn't have been upset with Christianity if Christianity had been pre presented just as another religion. The problem with Christianity that they had was Christianity said we're the only true religion and all the others are false. There's only one God. The Romans kind of collected gods and religions in a way. They, you know, they just incorporated new ones into the stuff they already had. So they didn't have any problem at all with all of that. But with Christians, they had a real problem. Uh, the multitude, it says in the next verses of uh, 22 to 24, and the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. They beat them, mistreated them, threw them into jail and chained them. Now, verse 25 says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Now, that's not a normal reaction, is it? Uh, if you were beaten badly, thrown into jail, chained to the floor, and maybe to another jailer, would you be singing hymns? Well, actually, we should be. Uh, but most of us probably would not uh, be to the level that Paul was. <clears throat> Paul loved the Lord so much that when he was persecuted, he actually thanked God for the uh, privilege of being persecuted like his Lord was. He thanked God that he was counted worthy to suffer for Christ. That is where we should be, but I suspect most of us are still uh, going in that direction and have not arrived yet. <clears throat> now, uh, verses 26 to 27, we have a really cool thing happen. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. I know you're anxious to hear what's next, but we finished our study for the day. Come back next time, and we'll talk about it. I'll let you know what happens. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the folks that have tuned in. Bless them. Hope they're enjoying the scripture, dear Lord. Speak to them personally in the way that they need to hear from you, Father, through the scriptures that we cover. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. See you next time.